Hello, good afternoon. I'm the third co-organizer of the conference, uh, Dimitris Chapogas, and I'm representing the University of Vienna. I am delighted now to introduce to you our first opening address, Juan Barata Mir. Uh, Mr. Barata is the principal advisor to the representative on freedom of the media of the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. Before joining this organization, Mr. Barata was a professor of communication law and vice dean of international relations at the Ramon Lull University in Spain. Mr. Barata has advised a number of organizations, including the Catalonia Audiovisual Council and the United Nations, and his research and writings focus on issues of freedom of expression and media regulation, and that's why he is eminently qualified to speak to us today about freedom of expression. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Juan Barata Mir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dankeschön. Uh, Haristopoli, I think. Yes. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to, to be here uh, representing the, the representative on, on freedom of the media in this uh, fantastic uh, venue. Uh, freedom of expression uh, guarantees, uh, on the one hand, uh, what can be called a sphere of uh, human self-determination or self-fulfillment uh, for every individual. Expression means exteriorizing your opinions, your thoughts, your sentiments. So freedom of expression means uh, realization of the principle of human dignity. On the other hand, freedom of expression is also an instrument that facilitates the liberation, the exchange of ideas, exposition to shocking and unexpected points of view, political discussions and citizen decision-making processes in several important social areas, including, of course, but not only, elections. However, the fact that information and opinions are the blood of a democracy does not mean that only democratic and constructive discourses uh, should be protected. We should be, be very aware of the fact, as uh, the Greek thinker uh, Castoriadis said, that democracy is the sole regime that takes risk, that faces openly the possibility of its self-destruction. Living in a democratic society means to accept the possibility of listening to opinions that offend and disturb us to live with people who do not share our values, and to protect the dissemination of the most outrageous points of view. Moreover, democracy is supposed to be the most advanced free and free system for common life, which means at the same time that it, it is exposed to the highest level of <coughs> scrutiny and criticism. Probably it is a kind of a paradox to say that the most perfect democracy is the one that shows more openly its flaws. These two days we will be discussing about freedom under pressure, but which pressure and where it comes from. During the 20th century, states assume a very active role in the regulation uh, of free expression. And it the, in this does not necessarily mean censorship or less freedom. Audiovisual rules, protection of pluralism, or the establishment of public service media outlets go beyond that original idea, that liberal idea of lack of state inter interference, putting in the hands of public institutions the remit to create and foster the conditions for a fair and equilibrated access to information by citizens. Now I quote John Locke, who said that the end of law is not, or should not be, to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. For in all the states of created beings capable of law, where there is no law, there is no freedom. 
Digital te technologies are nowadays challenging traditional state intervention in the media. Technology multiplies the number of voices able to disseminate ideas and information with global reach. Transnational market forces are powerful and technology is eliminating the physical barriers that made this type of territorial approach possible. Private global actors try to erode the classical state position of influence on the dynamics of the public sphere. Transnational institutions like the EU, as it has been mentioned before, try to foster the creation of regional markets in which certain values and principles are particularly protected. At the same time, individual nodes of the internet push to create new allegiances, new territories, new nations, crossing borders and circumventing the excess of governance of government control. This, has, this, of course, has implications for how we protect free expression and where the possible restrictions may come from. It is a debate about globalization, cultural identity, national values, market power, technology, and, of course, about freedom. In some areas of the world, uh, we'll see that an open, multi-stakeholder and collaborative, collaborative approach to networks, uh, governance, management and functioning will allow free access from citizens to content, services and applications. And this will probably be called the free world. Even if the necessary degree of openness, transparency or neutrality of networks will raise discussions and confront different visions. At the EU, the, the vision that we have at the EU about net neutrality is probably different than the vision in the US, and both are democratic, uh, let's say, territories, and both are engaged in internet freedom. Other states, of course, will try to preserve and shape the forging of national imagery, hindering the potential reach of networks and therefore restricting their citizens' ability to engage in a global discussion. Of course, this is not a black and white dis dis distinction. Defending copyright, safeguarding national security or combating uh, organized crime are values and interests being raised by democratic governments in order to shape the free flow of ideas and content in the networks. So, as I think we will be discussing today and tomorrow, the problem is not only about the Iranian or the North Korean government not allowing the citizens uh, to freely surf on the web. It's about something that has been described by certain authors as the gap between what the people of democratic countries thought their rights were and what their governments had to be given away in return for security and intelligence. And I think that this gap between the rights that we thought we had and the rights that we actually, that actually were recognized and protected by our government, this is a, a gap that is deeper than we, uh, and higher, wider than we expected. As uh, Justice Brandeis from the United States said, fear is the enemy of reasoned, ordered liberty. But not all the pressure is coming from governments. We should not neglect the capacity of private actors like big portals, search engines, technology manufacturers and others as to directly intervene in the conditions of circulation, distribution and access to content and ideas in new platforms. In other words, in other words despite the power which traditional state uh, institutions seem to keep vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, physical networks, the truth is that the few transnational private companies are probably the real gatekeepers, and if I may say so, the real censors of the digital world. At least in many cases, the effectiveness of the so-called internet freedom will be in the hand of these private entities. When you, if you go to Google's website and you read uh, uh, the, the mission statement of Google, you'll find this one. 
to collect and organize the world's information. To me, it looks scary. As you can see, there are many things uh, to be discussed. We are very far from, uh, let's say, the first historical texts and discussions proclaiming and protecting freedom of expression as citizens' rights, thinking only of, uh, I mean, the possibility of a standing on a wooden box or, uh, uh, or discussing in a cafe about, about uh, um, issues of uh, public interest. Allowing people to say what they want and to listen to what they want has become a very sophisticated matter which has many legal and technological implications. I do hope that today and tomorrow's discussion will at least help uh, in raising adequate awareness about the importance of the problems we are facing and the need to tackle them in their full complexity. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Aus lauter Freude als Erster zu Ihnen haben sprechen zu dürfen, habe ich ganz vergessen, mich selbst vorzustellen. Mein Name ist Nikolaus Hamann und ich vertrete den Arbeitskreis kritischer Bibliothekarinnen und Bibliothekare. Und auch wenn es vielleicht auf den ersten Anschein nicht so ausschaut, die Existenz und die Aktionsfähigkeit von Bibliotheken hat ganz viel mit Informationsfreiheit zu tun. Doch nun zu unserem nächsten Gast, Helmut Scholz, ist Abgeordnete zum Europäischen Parlament äh, für die Deutsche Partei Die Linke. Äh, unter anderem seinem Einsatz ist es zu verdanken, äh, dass das Anti-Produktpiraterie-Handelsabkommen ACTA äh, vom Europäischen Parlament zurückgewiesen wurde und daher nicht in Kraft treten konnte. Äh, dieser Vertrag hätte äh, sehr viel schärfere Regelungen für den Bereich des sogenannten geistigen Eigentums mit sich gebracht äh, und die Informationsfreiheit äh, noch weiter eingeschränkt. Herr Scholz, herzlich willkommen in Wien. Ich danke Ihnen, dass Sie zur Konferenz anreisen konnten und bitte Sie um Ihre Grußworte. First of all, let me thank you for having been invited to Vienna to this Uh, hall in this university, uh, I'm impressed because we are just approaching the electoral campaign for the European elections on 25th of May this year. And in Germany we started already and I was just two weeks ago in Hamburg in a similar very impressive uh, room um, in the, in the Rathaus uh, in, in Hamburg and there we discussed Uh, aspects and problems of international politics, in particular of the economic development and cooperation. And we discussed about the TTIP agreement. Mm. And as I just was addressed to be responsible or partly responsible also for the ability of the European Parliament to reject the ACTA agreement, uh, I will clearly say the ACTA agreement for the European Union is not any longer at the table. But with the TTIP, with other negotiations, all the questions of intellectual property rights, of the right of access to our information, of self-determination, are again on the table and could be discussed and could be integrated into other treaties. So it is an ongoing democratic struggle on self-determination of citizens all over the European Union, but not only, only there because the ACTA agreement remains. And we have already two countries. Uh, and the ratification process of the ACTA agreement, so only for the European Union, it is not any longer there. But what does that mean under the conditions of internet, of worldwide technologies, communication linkage, etc.? And by explaining this, I want to say we are speaking here about really a very big issue, a burning issue, Uh, a burning issue of democracy in all stages. And nearly no technological development in the history of mankind has influenced our societies as fast as profoundly um, at the World Wide Web and digital data processing. And I, I think all of you agree with me that we shouldn't be a prophet 
or fooled to know that modern communication and information technologies will have a deep and strong impact on all areas of our life, from the economy, of our politics, to culture, and the privacy. And uh, one of my colleagues in the European Parliament, Jan Philipp Albrecht, he is a, a responsible author for the directive on the data protection, one of the big uh, files in the work of the European Parliament in this outgoing legislative period, is dealing with uh, saying, do we have a right to forget? Who knows what I have said today will be the same approach of dealing with the problem tomorrow or after tomorrow. How I deal with my inclusion in our social exchange of, uh, of views. So digital communication and data procession, virtual performances, immaterial products coin the social, cultural and also economic development in even strong and strong measure. They are central basis and accelerator of the way of our living, of the way of our production, of the way of consumption as well as of communication. Shortly, of our co-living, of our coexistence in our states, in our cities, in municipalities, there where I, where I day for day uh, look for a job or have a job, where I have to uh, to get the chance for for um, for education, for higher education, all these aspects are in the, in the midst of this challenge. And with realizing, in this opening I also want to clearly state that the misuse of data, of all data, personal ones, economic ones, of enterprises, of state ones, uh, of the ministries, of dealing with the constitution uh, of our uh, states, uh, by, data, uh, by Edgar Snowden, I would like to stress we are facing here also a real global problem, not only a European, an Austrian, a German, etc., but we are dealing with a problem which means what means freedom of information under pressure, on, right on information. And this is a democratic challenge, and I want to clearly stress that my uh, understanding of this very important uh, conference, and I'm very grateful that you are organizing, organizing such a conference this year, is dealing with the issue, nothing remains as it was, or maybe more precise, as it has seemed to be. And we have to, to readdress this challenge if you are speaking about the uh, right on information. And I can only call and encourage uh, the, the students and the, and the pupils here from Austria, when they are just faced with the with opening that 400,000 uh, files are just uh, leaked to, to the surveillance of, uh, of access to everybody, also of the economies. And, and, and even pupils have then, in this um, understanding, not, not any longer the right of forgetting. Um, or, um, uh, I, being a politician from the left-wing uh, confederal group in the European Parliament, the United um, European uh, Left and Nordic Green Left, uh, I wanted to give uh, two more examples of our current work in that direction. Uh, I would say that the digital revolution has lost, lost its innocence. The protection of birth, personal data and privacy of global spying of even entire states by intelligent services, as well as the use of collected information for military purposes. Only one, one, one example in the direction, cyberspace uh, war um, and cyberspace uh, tools, uh, are aspects uh, that are on the agenda today again. And on the other hand, it is important to protect the freedom of information expression to everybody uh, and to offer access to the wealth of information, of the knowledge, of the culture to everyone, especially to the people living in the third world. So it's not only uh, also limiting to ourselves, but we have also to rethink our relationship to citizens in other parts of the world. And these are questions uh, that have to be asked 
um, together with the civil society, it must be a matter of creating, binding, and verifiable rules in order to use opportunities of information society in the interest of progress, of development, of human rights. And as just exactly 30 days ago, on the 28th of January, there had been the European Day of uh, Data Protection, I want to say, yes, we should also look what will bring the, uh, the interview of the um, um, Committee of uh, Liberal Freedom in the European Parliament with Edgar Snowden about the list of urgent demands <coughs> we have to tackle. Um, and uh, I would say this list of demands to, we are discussing today and tomorrow um, has never been as complex and long as this year. So I wish the Congress all the best, a lot of success, and I'm uh, glad to be here and to follow the discussion. Thank you.